Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Sweet Action by Six Point Brewing Company in beautiful Brooklyn, New York. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. Sweet Action is a juicy blonde wheat ale that was originally brewed just for a friend's party and then later named after a magazine. Old Sweet Action. That was my nickname in high school. It's hoppy with just the right amount of fullness and has an ABV of 5%. Sweet Action was only brought to us by way of action of the sweet. And first up, we have Kevin in Asheville, North Carolina. Big shout out to Kent in Bloomington, Indiana. And a long distance cheers to Randy. She's in Salt Lake City, parts of Utah. Big shout out to Carol in Portland, Oregon. Keep Portland weird. And a cheers to our friend Arjun in British Columbia. And last but not least, we have Mark in Aberdeen, United Kingdom. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And we're only about a year behind, so you'll hear your name next year. And just a reminder, because I get this all the time, Captain, the captain writes all the music for the show. Yeah. I keep getting emails going, the music's so good for the show. Mm. Who does that? Well, the captain writes the music, he performs it, he records it, so we're very lucky to have the maestro here in the garage. It's not produced by Puff Daddy, if that's what you want to know. And if you want to contribute to the conversation, go to truecrimegarage.com. We have our blog there. You can post your theories on the different cases, post questions. We try to answer all the questions that are posted there. Join in the discussion. And anybody wondering, uh, you know, my sister found a Yorkie. Uh, I will not be keeping the Yorkie. We found its owner. It was a nice, sweet old lady that had heart surgery. So we got the dog back to the nice, sweet lady. Oh, congratulations. All right, Captain, that's enough of the business. That's enough of the dog business. Doggy style. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Thirty-year-old Karina Vetrano was murdered in August of 2016. And where we left off, Captain, we were a little over six months into the investigation into her unsolved murder. During that time, Karina Vetrano's parents, they pulled out all of the stops. They did everything they could to keep her name and image in the public's mind. They started off with coming up with reward money. The reward money eventually grew to an astronomical amount. It was like $235,000 at one point was the reward money that was offered for information leading to Karina's killer. And at some point I read that it got up to maybe $300,000 or maybe even more, but it was started by the parents Mm -hmm. and then the community. But then NYPD, I think donated a 300 or $300,000, $35,000 to the fund. Yes, it, it was it was a big effort by everybody. Now, one thing that they did as well was they they organized a memorial walk. Uh, this was to take place at a Queens Park where more than one thousand people turned out. Uh, the Vetrano family stated that they were even seeking supernatural help to find the killer of their daughter. Phil Vetrano said at the event, "Quote: We are open to any help." from people that see beyond the living Mm -hmm. and anyone with thoughts or visions, please don't hesitate to come forward. Then Karina's parents made a very unusual offer to the man that strangled their daughter. It started off with Karina's parents urging the killer to turn himself in. Uh Kathy talking to the killer said, we will get you. It's just a matter of time. Karina's parents have made it their mission to keep the public's attention on the case, hoping someone can give them answers. Phil, her father even offered his daughter's killer a choice in the directing of the reward money that has been raised saying that if you turn yourself in, I will make sure that reward money goes to the person of your choice. It could be your sister. It could be your mother, your brother, 
Yeah. It's a life changer. You will be caught right. no matter what. So take advantage of this situation. I, and my first thought on that was, oh, this piece of shit's not going to give this money to charity or something. And why would this, uh, you know, persuade him to come forward? But yeah, maybe if it's, you know, um, I'm going to shame my family, but they're going to catch me anyway. So if I could shame my family and then give this money to my mother or, or father or whatever, but you'd have to be a pretty shitty person to take that money, right? Well, here's the thing, though. And this is a very interesting tactic that is not often employed. We have, you could have a situation where the, the real killer, the guy that did this, is on edge. Maybe he's suicidal. Maybe this is something he didn't intend to do or for whatever reason he feels like this is something that happened. He knows he did it. But, but he's on edge and, right. and, and there's a tipping point. Now here's the thing. If he has some kind of trigger, he could tip in the, in the direction of suicide or fleeing the area. Right. Or if there's something like this, could you tip him in the direction of turning himself in? Look, you've been walking around with this, with this guilt, this yeah. extreme heavy guilt on your shoulders for six months now. And the, maybe you, maybe you're experiencing sleepless nights. Maybe you've increased your alcohol and drug use. Like they said was possible in the profile. Maybe you are suicidal. This gives you a chance. This gives you an out. And I, we know you don't want to go to prison, but this gives you an out. This gives you a chance to walk away from all that guilt that you've been carrying around. This gives you a chance to not kill yourself, not end your life and to do something right to finally do something right. And guess what? We can give that money to, to your mother or to your sister or to somebody of your choosing. You're right. Is it a shitty thing for this guy to accept the money? 100%. Is it a shitty thing for one of his family members to accept the money? 100%. Right. But I think this is a desperate plea and a smart, intelligent plea yeah. from the, the victim's parents that desperately need answers and a community that needs answers as well. Well, and you don't know what tip they got. I mean, even if it's coming from a, a psychic, right? And mm -hmm. the psychic could say, hey, look, this this killer, uh, he's going to commit suicide. And if he commits suicide, you know, or it doesn't even have to be a thought from a psychic. It could just be your gut feeling mm -hmm. that, hey, if this, if this was just an attack that went too far and then now he's going to kill himself, once they kill themselves, you're probably not going to find answers, right? You're because, never going to, he, he'll take the information and he'll take that guilt with him to his grave. Right. Now the, the thing here though, captain is it's a right around, uh, just over the six month point where there's a break in the Vetrano case. And right. this takes place on February 4th, 2017, when the police announced that a suspect in the strangulation death of Karina Vetrano had been taken in for questioning. This is Channel R. Lewis, a 20-year-old Brooklyn resident. He was being interviewed by police. He would later be arrested and charged with her murder. Now, who is Channel Lewis and how did the police come to suspect him of being the guy? So Channel Lewis came to the attention of the police from a member of the NYPD, an off-duty officer that lived in Karina Vetrano's neighborhood, had noticed this young man lurking in the neighborhood. Apparently, he was walking around after dark looking in cars, right. and he was checking the neighborhood for uh, unlocked car doors. And was, was he ever wearing a wool cap? That was, I looked for that information and he did not give a description of this man and what he was wearing. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing though, this dude, this officer is off duty, right? And he's driving his, I believe it was his kids, his daughters maybe. And he spots this guy lurking around in the neighborhood. And it does occur to him that he somewhat resembles the sketch that he had seen yeah. of this guy. Yeah. And sometimes they make a sketch and then they make the arrest. And then you go, I don't look like the guy, <laughs> but in this case, uh, and I'll put this on, uh, Instagram so you can see the side by side comparison. It looks, it looks similar. It looks similar. We, you know, we should mention that, um, channel Lewis, he is too young to fit the description of the, of the guy. You know, we, 
in the description, they say possibly 35 to 45 years old. Channel's only 20 years old. Yeah, but this is this is where I differ a little bit uh, because to me... Did the sketch look to you like a 35-year-old guy? No. Right. Uh, but also... Maybe 35 at the oldest. No way you're talking about a 40, 45-year-old dude. Yeah, but this... But it's weird because this kid, I mean, you know, he's pretty young, but it's he looks a little old. Like he has like an old demeanor yeah. to him, if that makes sense. Yeah, he's got an he's got an older look to him. The thing is, when he's brought in for questioning and we first start seeing his face on the TV, right? He's shaved. He's clean shaved. And the sketch clearly shows a guy with a with a beard, like a a captain size beard. Not a not a big full crazy one, just one right up on the face there. Right. Now, um beards are normally on the face. <laughs> if um if this dude when they brought him in for questioning, if he had grown a beard, I think he would look almost identical to the guy that we're seeing in the sketch. Yeah. Pop so, that guy's beanie on and see what happens. So this this under this undercover, he's not undercover, he's off duty. <laughs> okay. The man never he's never off the clock. He's, he's always working. He's always undercover. So he's off duty, he's driving his kid somewhere. He spots this guy and he decides to he follows him quite a bit that night throughout the neighborhood. Uh-huh. Uh, he sees him retreat back into the park area. Now, so this off-duty officer does a little investigating, and he finds that a man matching the same description as the guy that he had seen just the night before, he had been stopped and spoken to by police on what they call a, uh, you know, a stop and frisk situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with this stop and frisk situation, but I want to be clear. There was a reason they had probable cause the night that this man was stopped and frisked. I enjoy it. <laughs> well, what it was, was there was a, a man seen in the Vetrano neighborhood that had been lurking around after dark. This is a separate, separate incident. Uh-huh. And the guy was, had a crowbar and appeared to be looking into residents. Now, people, multiple people had called police. So when the police show up, they didn't just stop and frisk this dude because they just saw him walking down the street for no reason. Right. They show up to the neighborhood and they were stopping and frisking people that they saw walking about in the neighborhood after dark. They obtained Channel Lewis's name and address during this stop and frisk. Well, this off duty officer. He now tracks down the name and address of this dude, and he passes it along to the police, stating, look, I've seen this dude in the neighborhood, that he was in a neighbor in our neighborhood on another occasion. Mm-hmm. I saw him retreat into the park, and he somewhat matches the description of the guy that you're looking for in the sketch. Well, does he fit anything in the profile that was released by the FBI? Um, the thing here is we said that the officer had obtained his address, so... The interesting theor- thing here is that Channel is not homeless like the profile had suggested. He he lived with his mother and two sisters in the projects in East New York. Now, the interesting thing here, though, is it's just three miles from the murder scene. However, he did have a good knowledge of the area, just like the profile had suggested. He had right. a history with Spring Creek Park. He, in fact, had two violations uh, for breaking rules in the park. Well, what did he break? I think w- they didn't go specify what these uh, violations were as far as both of them goes, but one of them was for public urination. Okay. Um, I don't know what the second one was. Now, the, the police had questioned this guy a couple of times. Uh, in fact, he had actually been on their radar for a while uh, because the, the off-duty officer passed along his name a couple months before he was actually arrested. Right. The police went and spoke with him the first time. He was questioned. He was questioned pretty thoroughly, but they had no, they didn't have anything on him. But he's a little off. He's a little off, but he also, on that first incident of being questioned, he didn't provide them with anything. He didn't give them any information, any incriminating information. Now, the second time that they spoke with him, they, this time they asked him to submit to a DNA test, which he did. Yeah. And it comes back that his DNA matched DNA for, that was collected from Karina's body and cell phone. Yeah, so it would have been found underneath her fingernails, and then that would be pure DNA. They get a hit on that. Then they get a hit on the cell phone. Um, 
but I believe the cell phone and then the DNA that they got off her back would have both been just touch DNA. So we have actual DNA from underneath the fingernails and then touch DNA from the cell phone and her back. There's well, this case is not without controversy and there's some thought on in the regards to the DNA. Um, before we get into hashing that out, captain, um, some background information on Lewis. He didn't have other than these, these rules violations. He didn't have like an extended criminal history. He didn't have a criminal history that suggested that he was a violent person or a rapist or a murderer. Right. Um, but he reportedly, people said that he had a hatred for women. He had a strong hatred for women, uh, that he once told a teacher's aide that he wanted to stab all of the girls at his school. Oh, well, that's nice of him. That's yeah. That's, that's an interesting threat. Yeah, there. but he's off. But what does that mean? Cause I, I couldn't find that clear. You know, like when you look at like Jesse, miss Kelly, right? Mm-hmm. Jesse, miss Kelly, um, low IQ. Mm-hmm. But with Lewis, it's like, is he mentally handicapped or is he, or uh, look, is I'm, he- I'm no expert. Um, you know, I went to school for computer right? and, uh, and one num- of our listeners numbers. pointed out that I went to k- school for number, not yeah. numbers, just oh, number. number. Okay. Yeah. Um, computer and, and number <laughs> minored in number. And if anybody else wants to point out all the things that I say wrong, you, go you all, for it. You also went to school for, uh, geography because you're so good at saying the town's names and, and mixing up the cities. Yes. Yeah. But okay. So when it says that he, when people say that he's off or, you know, you said that he's off, right. Man, I, like I said, he's, I'm no expert. He's definitely off. Um, yeah, but there's I, I don't different know levels. That, like, you know, my friends would tell you I'm off. Yeah. You're off. <laughs> he's a little off, but you know, this guy is like a little more than off. Well, I can, I can, I think I can clarify this a little bit. Okay, so where I don't think that he is, um, I don't think that he has limited capabilities. I think that he's just kind of out there. Okay. Um, and we have him, he had been taken into protective custody numerous times. He was described as a loner. He was described by many people as mentally unstable. A neighbor who had lived near the family told reporters that this man terrorized people in the neighborhood. Now, upon further checking into his background, when he was growing up, when channel Lewis was growing up, he was enrolled in a private school. This was not like a private school for gifted individuals. This was a private school for children with behavioral problems, with severe behavioral problems. Insane kids. Yes. Right. Well, the other thing though, captain is not only does his DNA match, um, but I want to talk about the confession of a killer, right? Because Lewis, he Lewis he offers up a confession in regards to Karina's case in Howard Beach, and the full story that we can now put together from the suspect's own words, witness statements, and according to investigators, is this: that on August second, our suspect Channel Lewis had left his home after arguing with his family, and he walked over to the park. This is where he came across and then attacked Karina Vetrano. While it is believed to have been a random attack, it is definitely not known for certain if Lewis had ever seen Vetrano before or premeditated the attack on her. Channel in his confession said, quote, I was mad. I saw red. Lewis says he grabbed Vetrano as she ran past him. He said she clawed at his face and he hit her five times before she was knocked unconscious. He goes on to say, quote, she didn't yell. She was finished. I finished her off. I strangled her. She fell into the puddle and drowned. I got up and I wiped off the blood and she was calm. She was in the pool of water. After telling the cops how he quote, finished her off channel. Lewis seemed to think that he could pay his way out of murder charges asking where do we go from here is there a restitution program or something right before confessing he had told detectives i want to change my life i'm sorry for what i did he insisted that he did not molest the woman even though her jogging shorts had been pulled down 
Yeah, but the, even the cops said from the beginning that because she put up a fight, it, it's probably the reason why that didn't fully happen. Right. So they, they can't say that she was, quote unquote, raped. Yeah, so he said he didn't sexually assault her, but he says after the attack, after he had, quote, finished her off, that he had walked home uh, walking back up the bike path. He said he was shaken up. He was hoping to get home to get napkins to stop the bleeding from the scratches she had left on his face. When asked why he attacked the jogger, Lewis confusingly responded that he killed Vetrano because of a guy that had moved into his house and into the neighborhood playing loud music, which disrupted his life. Now, after the attack, right, this guy is psychosis or something. Yeah. After the attack, his mother recalled channel returning to the home that night. She said that he did look disheveled and his clothes were torn. He told her that he had been mugged by a group of men. And of course, There's really no evidence of such an attack and no police report was ever filed. Now, the next day, this is something that you and I find incredibly incriminating, no matter even if you get past the DNA evidence. The next day. Well, you got to get past the DNA evidence. Then you got to get past the fact that he confesses. Mm -hmm. And then. Well, the next day on August 3rd, Lewis's father, who is a he's a former school principal. He took Lewis to a local emergency room for treatment of scratches and cuts on Lewis's upper body. Now, Channel Lewis had also suffered a hand injury, this most likely the hand that he had used to throw Karina's phone into the weeds, leaving his DNA on the phone in the process. All right, so I'm going to say something. I'm going to bring this up. Don't don't hit me, okay? Don't okay. throw don't throw your beer bottle at me. When I'm researching this case his father then comes out and says look he's a sweet boy he never would have done this Mm -hmm. this is way out of character and then other people in the community you know even though people said that he was stalking people or you know terrorizing people in the neighborhood um that he was a sweet boy so there's like two sides of this coin and it started making me feel like okay, if this guy is off and if he is a little slow, right, Mm -hmm. then did they plant this DNA evidence? Did they get him to confess? Okay, so the reason, a big reason why this case is not without controversy is this, because they have DNA evidence, one, and two, they have a confession. And then three, we got Channel who's pleading not guilty to the crime. So a lot of people are going, well, how can you have a confession and DNA evidence? And then you got a defendant that's pleading not guilty. How could he possibly not be guilty? So, well, well, but we do know that people get false confessions. Yes. That has happened. And we also know that there's been plenty of cases where not plenty of them, but there's been a handful of cases where the you could tamper with the DNA evidence to get it to say what you want it to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and the thing as far as Channel Lewis goes in my own personal opinion of him, and I don't I don't know him. Uh, All I know of him is using his words that I've poured through and seeing him in interviews and seeing him on TV. A lot of the times, unfortunately, when his hands are handcuffed behind his back. So maybe you're not getting the best perspective about him. Right. But. What I can gather is for lack of better words and excuse me, I know there are more intelligent words out there in regards to this, but to speed things along, I don't find him to be slow per se. I find him to be a little crazy, if not full on. And the reason why I say that is because of this. If you go, if you pour through his, his confession, while it makes sense to the way that the attack occurred and how we know that it occurred, his reasoning behind things doesn't seem to make any sense to anyone. Well, and the, yeah. the, where the controversy is, is you have it, it, it was discovered that the DNA underneath her fingernails was actually mixed DNA, meaning that there were several types of DNA found underneath her fingernails. Now using that mixed DNA, they could not rule out, 
Channel Lewis's DNA having been under her fingernails. Right. What they can prove is his DNA absolutely was on her phone and absolutely was found on her either neck or back, depending on which report you read. Right, but that was touch DNA, and that's new technology, and there could be something up with that. But to me, this sounds like, you know, when his father's defending him, to me it sounds like, you know, he's early 20s. Mm-hmm. This would be the time in your life where he's doing crazy stuff. He's acting manic. So there's a chance that he has some sort of bipolar or schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the reasons that he said he had to kill this person is, well, I have an argument with my family. And then there was this guy that moved into the neighborhood with a loud boom box. Mm-hmm. Sounds to me like, you know, this loud barking dog that told me to go kill women. Right. So the Sam. So I think his father saying he's a sweet boy or other people in the, in the community saying he's a sweet boy. Well, maybe he was, but now he has this mental illness. And because of this, you know, this led to the murder. Well, and there, there's a great article out there and I believe it's on uh daily com where you can get some more information on this, but it, it sounds like some people have called into question how they obtained the confession, uh, that they, they made him wait for hours and upon hours upon hours before right. getting this confession from him. Um, they, he doesn't have an attorney present during the course of giving the confession. However, it's never even stated that he requested one. Um, so I, where yeah, I but don't, if you're crazy or you're a little off, are you going to request a lawyer? I don't love the methods that they used. However, I have to keep in mind, they have his DNA matching at the time of, of this before they get the confession from him. And second, and the thing that's often pointed out in this article specifically is that, you know, you have psychiatrists saying that and psychologists saying that people don't just all of a sudden snap, you know, like it, it looks from his confession that he all of a sudden snapped and attacked and killed someone They and I've heard not only, you know, psychologists say this, but I've also heard uh, people with extensive criminal law enforcement backgrounds say the same thing that people don't just usually just don't snap all of a sudden. Usually you see a long history of it. And what I want to remind the people that wrote the article at the daily beast and that, and that contributed to that article is we actually see previous behavior. We, we, he's been, he's been talked to by police several times. We have neighbors saying that he was terrorizing the neighborhood while he might be a sweet boy at home. He might be a mama's boy. He might be great to his sisters and to his mom. He went to a private school that was for people with behavioral problems. This kid didn't just snap one day. The thing that's going to be very interesting thing here, captain is it seems to me like he understands that he's done something wrong. So he knows the difference between right and wrong. He just doesn't fully grasp the full scope or gravity of the situation or the acts that he has committed. Right. So we have DNA that matches on top of that. You have a confession and on top of the confession, even if you believe that the confession was, um, you know, obtained in a weird way, we were just talking, uh, you know, a little bit off, off mic for a second off the record. Uh, yeah, off the record. When a new show comes out soon. Um, most people assume that this murder took place, the motive was sexual, that it was rape, then murder. But there's no, like we said, DNA evidence of that. And during his confession, he claims that he you know, pulled her into the weeds and also used her shorts as a way to pull her in, and that would explain why the shorts were down, Correct. but there was no actual sexual assault. So that makes his confession seem a lot more likely and then on top of that, it's you went to the hospital for these cuts and scrapes yeah. all over your body. And, and on parts of your body that was suspected to have been occurred, like the FBI said, and on his hand, which would have touched the cell phone. Right. So if you think the first two are fabri- fabricated in any way by law enforcement, you can't fabricate that. You can't fabricate him going to the emergency room to, to take care of these cuts. Yeah, the interesting thing to me, Captain, is I think that this person belongs behind bars, and I know the Vetrano family and everybody in the community wants to see this guy go away forever. I think that I don't know that I fully agree that prison is the appropriate place for him. I think he does need to be locked up somewhere, and he there's a more appropriate place for him. I don't think he fully understands what he did, nor did he have full control 
over himself. But at the end of the day, regardless of that, he's extremely violent. And most likely this will occur again. He needs to go somewhere. I just don't know where that is. And he needs to go there for the rest of his life. If you're a fan of True Crime Garage, you probably love all things true crime, mystery, and maybe even conspiracy theories. If you're like me, you're always searching for what really happened. You should check out the new podcast, Conspiracy Theories. The host of Conspiracy Theories tell the complicated stories behind the world's most controversial events and possible cover-ups. Because the truth isn't always the best story, and the official story isn't always the truth. With captivating storytelling, each episode takes you through the complex stories as if you were really there. You can check out episodes covering the death of Princess Diana and Area 51 now. And with new episodes coming out every Wednesday, you can expect episodes on the Illuminati, Chemtrails, and many more. Visit Apple Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for Conspiracy Theories. Again, that's Conspiracy Theories, C-O-N-S-P-I-R-A-C-Y-T-H-E-O-R-I-E-S, or visit parcast.com slash conspiracy to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash conspiracy to listen now. We've been telling you for a while about Madison Reed, and that's because for decades, women had only two options, outdated at-home hair color or the time and the expense of the salon. And Amy Arrett, their creator, created Madison Reed because she believes women deserve better than the status quo. And here at The Garage, we believe the same thing. Madison Reed has reinvented the way that women color their hair by offering the quality of salon color, but the convenience and affordability of at-home hair color. You'll look like you just came from the salon, but the reality is you have more me time to do what you love. So experience beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color. It's made in Italy. It's delivered to your door on your schedule for under $25. That's under $25. Join the hundreds of thousands of women who have tried and loved Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed would like to honor True Crime Garage listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code TCG. That's code TCG. Check out madison-reed.com today. Madison Reed, treat yourself. Audiobooks are great for helping you be a better you, whether you want to feel healthier, get motivated, or learn something new. And with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more, Audible has all the audio content you need to start your year on the right foot. We both use Audible all the time. I just finished a great book called Own the Moment by Carl Lentz, and one of my favorite books that I probably listen to once a year is Born Standing Up, A Comic's Life, told by Steve Martin. So whether it's on your phone, through your car, from a tablet, or at home on an Amazon Echo, you can get through a ton of books while doing almost anything. And Audible even lets you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off. Start a 30-day trial, and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com garage or text GARAGE to 500-500. That's audible.com slash GARAGE, or text GARAGE to 500-500 for a 30-day trial and a free first audiobook. You can do it with audiobooks. All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers. Now, 175 miles away on April 15th, 2017, Mm -hmm. we get a break in the Vanessa Marcotte case. Sources told the media a man was arrested in Worcester, Massachusetts. Authorities said that Angelo Colon Ortiz is facing multiple charges in connection with Vanessa Marcotte's death. Remember when law enforcement announced that they were looking for a dark colored SUV that had been seen around the time of the murder? Yeah. Well, an alert state trooper spotted an SUV matching the description being driven by a man who matched the description of the suspect. The trooper wrote down the license plate of the SUV on his hand. He's driving. 
mm-hmm. and then tracked down Angelo Colon Ortiz. While we should give credit where credit is due, Captain, the officer's name is, he is State Trooper Robert Patz. And this sighting of the SUV occurred mid to late March of 2017. Then he, along with another officer, went to the man's home the following day. They questioned him and asked him to give them a, to do one of those cheek swab DNA sample tests. Yeah. Open up your mouth. (laughs) He submitted to this. They took the information back. They submitted the test and later got a match. They matched this to DNA found at the crime scene. Upon receiving the results of that test, he was arrested and charged with murder. Now, Angelo Colon Ortiz, age 31, he's from Worcester, Massachusetts. He has no criminal history. He was married with three children, and he had lived in Worcester for less than a year at the time that he had been picked up. He worked for a third-party contractor of FedEx, and he made deliveries and was familiar with the town of Princeton, Mm -hmm. you know, as he made deliveries there frequently. Right. According to his neighbors, Colon Ortiz was described as perverted. And okay. <laughs> that's not how you want your neighbors to describe yeah. you. How's your neighbor? Oh, uh, well, the neighbor over here, he cuts his lawn pretty well um, regularly, once yeah. a week. Um, Joe over here, he's a pervert. <laughs> yeah. Angelo was, was described as perverted and often made vulgar sexual comments to people in the neighborhood. Now, Cologne Ortiz, People, yeah, he, meaning he had <laughs> women and men. Well, in the dogs and cats, they didn't give a statement, so who knows what he we was saying know. to them. Now, Cologne hey, Ortiz, nice pussy. <laughs> Cologne Ortiz worked early hours. Uh, he worked from a, approximately 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. Now, I'm not sure why this keeps coming up when we hear about him because. This attack occurred on a Sunday. I I wouldn't I don't see FedEx out doing deliveries on a Sunday, but mm-hmm. maybe that's the case. I think what they're trying to point out here is even if it were a work day, he was this attack occurred at a time that he was not accounted for. That, right. You know, he wouldn't have been busy at work at that time. Now, police were not quite sure what he was doing in the area of the murder or why he was even there to begin with. But information collected from his cell phone puts him or at least his phone in the area where and when Vanessa was killed. Yeah. Investigators believe that he, he plus, may have, plus his SUV. Yeah. Possibly well, or a, matching the description right. of his SUV. Mm-hmm. Now investigators believe that he may have spotted the attractive young woman walking alone, maybe even followed her for a bit before driving ahead and then parking his vehicle on the side of the road, opening up the hood, giving the appearance that his Ford Escape SUV had broken down and he was stranded. Right. When she got near the vehicle, he then attacked her. So if this theory is correct, then you're talking about premeditated assault with intent to commit rape at the very least. Well, let me just put this out there for everybody, right? I want everybody to listen good, right? Mm -hmm. Guy's on the side of the road, stranded. And he says, hey, lady, come over and help me. Just run. Mm -hmm. No, you're not going to help him. He can figure it out, right? Better safe than sorry. I mean, we've seen dirt bags like Bundy do this and, and other serial killers. Don't help him. Well, and there, there's another situation, though, too, to think about, Captain. It's very likely that he may not have even spoken to her, that he used this ruse as just a chance to be in the same spot as she would be in. And out of the vehicle. Yeah, because think about this. If he speaks to her or if he yells something to her, there's a chance she might react to this and take off, where if he just pretends to be on his phone, like, hey, he's calling for a record truck or calling right, for right. help. She's going to she's going to possibly put him off and think that it's just it, he's just stranded. She mm-hmm. may casually walk or jog by him, putting her within feet of him where he could, then can grab her or probably grab her from behind because right. just like our other victim, this is a very athletic woman. This is a woman that's not going to go down without a fight. Never go down without a fight. Further evidence against Colon Ortiz. Now remember Vanessa's body had been burned. Portions of her body had been burned. 
it was determined that gasoline was the accelerant that was used to light the body. She was killed sometime that Sunday afternoon after 1 p.m. and most likely before 3 p.m. when she was reported missing. Now, business records for a credit card in the name of Angelo Colon Ortiz was used on that same day on August 7th in the afternoon at 2.35 p.m. to purchase gasoline. This guy's a, a monster. At This was purchased, Captain, at a gas station that was just seven miles from where Vanessa's body was found. Now, I'm not very familiar with that area, but I'm guessing due to the population and the the roads that I checked out, Mm -hmm. there's a good chance that this seven-mile-away gas station might be the closest gas station to where the attack occurred. Right. That's just a 14-minute driving route from that approximate location. Now... Angelo Corlon Ortiz, he pled not guilty, um, and he was placed on a $10 million uh, bail. Uh, The charges that he's facing are aggravated assault, assault with intent to rape, and, of course, murder. So we have two situations, Captain, where obviously these cases, we know that they were not linked now, uh, regardless of the media linking them early on. However it's undeniable that they're similar in nature. I mean, the attacks are very similar. The the victimology extremely similar. Well, and they happen five days apart, but they're also at the same spot in the cases. We have Mm -hmm. people arrested. Now they're waiting trial and we'll see if these families get justice and these strong, beautiful women get justice. A couple of things that I want to point out here, captain, that I think that are lessons learned for the public regarding these cases. The, the thing that, stood out the most in both of these incidents after the murder occurred, when the investigation was rolling or any time that the investigation seemed to have taken gone to a standstill Mm -hmm. in both instances, they, they produced more information and they kept these cases in the public's mind. They kept them on the news and in the headlines. This was done by not only the families of both victims, but the communities and the law enforcement that was involved as well. Well, but it goes before that because these strong women decided to fight these bastards and by doing so collected the evidence that they need to put these guys away for the rest of their lives. I couldn't have said it better. And in fact, you stole my ending for what I was going to say there, but um, it's, it's good that we share the same opinion of that. The thing that I want to point out here though is Keeping this in the public's mind, what did we see this produce in both of these cases? Mm -hmm. It produced tips and leads that did eventually lead to the capture of both of these individuals. Another thing that I think we see here is where the cases are different, where the, the perpetrators are somewhat different, where I see somebody that's unstable and I don't fully know that any of us will understand why he committed the murder in the first case. In the second case, it's very obvious to me that Angelo Colon Ortiz, this was a sexually motivated case. This was a sexually motivated attack and murder for him. Right. And I actually think that he probably would have went on to do more of these. I actually think he could have killed more women. He could have at least have raped more women. Well, he possibly could have done this before. And I'm not. actually shocked that uh, given that nine months went by before his arrest, that he didn't commit something similar to this. One thing that I think may have prevented him from doing so. Remember, we often see in profiles of these types of offenders that they will pay attention to the media coverage on the cases. Mm-hmm. If he was in fact paying attention to the media coverage resulting uh, from Vanessa's murder, that he would have known that that physical profile was, was released about him. And he was probably, when he heard it, he's going, that sounds just like me. They've just described me Mm -hmm. and whatever I was intending to do or planning to do from here, I cannot do because there's a spotlight on me. They've just not narrowed it down to me yet. And in both cases, we also see off duty officers, uh, going above and beyond and they're paying attention. They're, they're, They're always on the job. They helped provide leads and tips that found these two individuals. And I, with you, Captain, I hope and pray that we get justice for both of these women and we get it very soon. Again, but you also got to applaud their 
their friends and family uh, for speaking out, especially Karina's mom and, and, and father. So I uh, applaud them. One topic we wanted to discuss here today, Captain, is ways to stay safe when you're when you're jogging. Yeah. Seems yeah. obvious given the cases that are covered. And this was pulled from several different areas, and in no way is this an advertisement for anybody. This is just information that we have found, and some of it, a lot of it coming from, according to runnersworld.com, mm-hmm. on suggestions for keeping you safe. Well, we have a lot of listeners that will run trails and stuff, mm-hmm. but also listen to our show at the same time. I, I could, uh, Some of the listeners say it helps them run faster. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't normally listen to podcasts when I, when I work out. Uh, well, you and I do bike. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not a jogger. I do bike on occasion. And I, I, I have found that some of these tips, I think I need to take upon myself to do some of these, these good things here. So, uh, tips for keeping you safe. They say the first thing you should do before you go out is, is to notify others and tell them how long you plan to be out. Mm -hmm. This allows loved ones to sound the alarm if you don't return on time. Now, there are several available apps out there that can help to keep you safe. One that is mentioned is the Glimpse app. This allows runners to set a timer that notifies certain people of their location if they're out longer than they had planned. Mm -hmm. Then we also have the Run Safe app. This allows a runner to send a text message to a certain contact or contacts at the start and end of a run. The app also includes a panic button feature in which a siren and strobe light play in addition to notifying contacts. The feature also records several minutes of sound that is also available to your contacts. And runnersworld.com also suggests that you carry an ID with you and that your cell phone has uh, emergency contact numbers on the back. Taped to the back of it. Mm -hmm. The Cambridge Police Department advises, of course, everyone to run with a friend when you can, obviously. The friend's not always available. Mm -hmm. Um, Or bring a whistle, and they also suggest leaving your money at home. Now, you can also, you know, in certain states, you can purchase and carry pepper spray, which I would recommend. Now, there's a another device out there that I would highly recommend. This one's called the Tiger Lady. It's a handheld device. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this. It's modeled after a cat's retractable claws. Uh, the device, it can you can use this to fight back and to fight off your attacker. It's also likely to collect DNA of your attacker. It's going to do some damage. Yeah, or carry a knife. Just carry a <laughs> knife. You know, we don't need these claws. Just carry a knife. Somebody attacks you, pull it out of your pocket, stab him right in the face. So what do you do, Captain, if you are being followed or fear that you are being followed? Well, I always take four right turns. That's mm-hmm. what I do. Uh, the, here's some suggestions. One is simply turn to look at the potential attacker. This sends a message that you won't be surprised by a possible attack. Right, you're letting them know, I see you. Mm-hmm. The uh, Another suggestion is to change your direction. If the person following you is moving on foot, change streets and your pace. If the person following you is in a car, walk in the opposite direction so it is harder for them to follow you. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we have this. Go to the nearest store or public place where there are other people. Yeah, that's a great idea. And once you're there, call the police. They say if there is if there is not a safe place to go, Make sure you keep moving, start screaming, so you can try to draw attention to the situation. Mm-hmm. And of course, one thing that that uh, we should mention: self defense courses. They're available in most cities. Uh, I suggest everyone check them out. I have been to some. I think they're very valuable tools that you can learn there. They're usually very affordable classes as well. If one every other week, I jump out of the bushes and attack them. Just to check just my... Just to see, you know, he's getting older. And I suggest these not only for our female listeners, but the male listeners as well. And a lot of these classes are something that you can take your children to, especially if you feel that they are mature enough not to use these methods, you know, just right, to pick on... on siblings. Yeah, just right. to pick on somebody on the playground. Yeah, so for all of our male and female runners out there, 
Uh, Be safe and be aware of your surroundings.